Okay, next up we have Ryan Harrington. Ryan is coming to us from Metropolitan State University of Denver. Ryan worked with Rich Neal this summer in CGD, and the title of his oral presentation is Decoding ENSO Diversity, Examining Eastern and Central Pacific Phases, Remote Responses, and Hydrological Effects. Welcome everybody, my name is Ryan Harrington. Um, as Jerry introduced me, um, my talk is on decoding ENSO diversity, examining the Eastern and Central Pacific phases, remote responses, and hydrological effects. Um, as a basic introduction into my uh, research here, um, the, the overall objective um, was to better understand the diversity of uh, the El Nino Southern Oscillation, or ENSO. Um, it's observable, ob observable phases and hydrological impacts. Um, a few of the research questions that were originally developed um, and actually evolved through the process um, were one, are the signals for each ENSO phase and subphase easily identifiable uh, to be able to allow for classification of each event? Um, can we identify observable signals in the response of the integrated water vapor and the total precipitation? And one that we didn't quite fully get to, uh, started, uh, but want to continue working on, is uh, trying to understand if those signals uh, can be used to detect uh, remote weather, regional and remote weather uh, features, such as atmospheric rivers. Um, and so, um, at, it, in a whole, um, it is the, uh, a predominant source of seasonal variability. It is only second to the Earth-Sun interaction that creates the seasons in itself. Um, and it does have global climate and weather impacts as well, um, with two main phases, one warm phase and one cold phase. Everybody knows these phases as La Nina and El Nino. Um, El Nino is characterized by sea surface temperature increases. Um, it has uh, the, the canonical warm tongue that you do see in the Pacific Ocean as well. Um, and shortly I will be able to show this for you guys. Um, and then there are two distinct subphases um, for uh, El Nino's in itself. La Nina is the opposite. So it does show a sea surface temperature decrease. Um, and it does show a cold tongue rather than a warm tongue. Um, and it also does have two, uh, uh, two subphases, but these subphases are not, not nearly as distinct as they are for El Nino. Uh, for some of the global impacts uh, and why it's so important to continue looking into this, our, uh, as, as climate changes, our understanding of impacts from large circulations like ENSO also change and evolve with it. Currently, what we're looking at for certain areas, um, you know, we're all from um, this, most of us are from this generalized area right here. Um, so we can see that uh, during the winter for El Nino and La Nina, that's where the largest impacts are for North America. Um, during the summer, uh, we don't really see much impacts from those as well. Um, other parts of the world um, either see uh, intensified uh, drying or uh, precipitation as well um, in response to La Nina and El Nino. Um, so how are uh, ENSO events identified? Um, they are identified by using ENSO regions. Um, the four ENSO regions that have been used as time has progressed is the Nino 1.2, Nino 3, the Nino 4, and the Nino 3.4. Um, for this research, I utilized the Nino 3.4 index and to help reduce some of the, the noise that we saw from the Nino 3.4 because it uses a five month rolling mean, I did also use the Oceanic Nino index or ONI for short, um, that uses a three month rolling mean as well. By uh, using the three, uh, Nino 3.4 index and averaging over the region, um, we are able to identify uh, within the standard deviation of plus or minus 0.4 degrees. Um, El Nino is uh, depicted in red, and La Nina is depicted in um, blue. All the areas in, in between are neutral years. Um, coming back to what uh, El Nino and La Nina are, they, uh, and they're two distinct subphases for Central Pacific and Eastern Pacific. Central Pacific, uh, uh, sorry, Eastern Pacific, uh, El Nino, uh, it does have a warming of sea, uh, sea surface that initiates in South America, uh, near South America, propagates westward. This does decrease the eastward shift of uh, the deep convection. And in that deep uh, eastward shift of deep convection, you have the opposite on the other side of the Pacific where it decreases um, in Asia, the maritime continent and Australia as well. Um, Central Pacific, um, you get more warming towards the international dateline 
Um, the deep convection will not extend as far east, and uh, the impacts are centered over the dateline as well. So precipitation, water vapor, um, also increase in, closer to the dateline. Uh, Eastern Pacific, uh, La Nina in this case, um, the upwelling um, is ne uh, upwelling near South America initiates the uh, sea surface temperature cooling, uh, resulting in a westward shift of deep convection. And uh, it also de uh, decreases the convection in the Americas, drying them out. Central Pacific, um, it, it's not as distinct for Central Pacific. Um, you do still see some dateline cooling, um, but the, the impacts are limited and inconsistent as well. Um, methods to be able to identify these specific years. Um, I had to do a literature review because uh, very few people had actually tried to classify um, each event um, since they started recognizing that there was different subphases. Um, I then in inspected every year from 1979 to 2023 for all three in, uh, variables of sea surface temperature, water vapor, integrated water vapor, and uh, total precipitation. Um, I used uh, satellite observation data from the Hattest and uh, the ERA-5 reanalysis. I then classified each event based off the observed sea surface temperature anomaly signals, focused on the top five for each phase, and then I uh, applied those same methods um, uh, to, to identify the same responses and signals for water vapor and uh, total precipitation. Uh, going back to the NINA 3.4 index, um, when they are classified, they do look like this. Um, I have every one of them ranked in here as well. Um, so Eastern Pacifics um, are typically the stronger, um, the Eastern Pacific El Ninos are the stronger events. Um, you do see a similar response in, El, uh, in La Nina as well. There, it's just not nearly as intense as far as the deviation and the, uh, the anomaly and the cooling. Um, as far as the top, top five events go, um, ranked um, up here, I'll, I'll just leave this up here for you guys to um, digest. Uh, there's quite a, quite a bit up there. Um, the one big thing to really notice here um, is, uh, where's the pointer, right? here for certain, right there, for certain years, like right here, 2015 did have a higher peak anomaly during the ONI index, per the ONI index. And that again is uh, to, uh, basically because of that three month rolling mean versus a five month rolling mean, you don't have as much interference or noise in the sea surface temperature anomalies. Um, the other good thing, uh, good, not a good thing, but thing to notice here is the peak season. Um, colloquially, we, we think of the, the peak for uh, all ENSO events to be roughly around December. Um, that is not the case even on a three-month rolling mean. Um, each one of them did peak in different seasons. This is the top five for uh, La Nina that's here as well. Um, for, uh, we do see the same issue, not issue, but same difference in the peak anomaly for El Ninos as we, where's the pointer? All right, right over here, same thing for the CP La Ninos as well. Um, same thing flows uh, for the peak season. Does not always happen in December for La Niña's um, based off the uh, three-month rolling mean seasons. Um, scattershot. Uh, these are the visual representations of the top five years um, composited. Um, El Niño, you can see the warm tongue that's right here off of South America. Um, the, the strongest cooling is also a lot further, uh, sorry, strongest warming is also a lot, uh, quite a bit further east um, than it is over in the Central Pacific El Nino, which is right there in that yellow box. One of the uh, most things that I, uh, biggest things I want to uh, point out here is the bimodal uh, response in the Central Pacific El Nino. Um, it is not, it does still present with somewhat of a warm tongue centered towards the dateline. It just has two different spots, essentially, that are in there as well. Um, this is typically because of the initiation of Central Pacific versus Eastern Pacific. Um, Central Pacific actually initiates from the warm pool rather than from the sea surface temperature differences um, that we uh, typically end up seeing off of South America as well. Uh, the Pacific warm pool is over by the uh, maritime continent as well. For La Nina, you see a lot of the same things. Uh, you see the cold tongue um, right here for La Nina, uh, for the Eastern Pacific. And then you do see some stronger um, cooling towards the center of the Pacific on uh, CP La Nina as well. Um, one of the big things to, oh, 
with their own one. Uh, one of the big things that I, I noticed here is in EP La Nina, the increase, this thing is like all weird. Um, right here, the warming that's in the Northern Pacific, um, it is stronger in an Eastern Pacific La Nina and does not extend as far um, west as it does over there in the CP La Nina that you can see right here as well. Um, as far as temporal differences go, um, when we cat categorize every single one of them here, uh, we've got six El Ninos, 12, uh, those are the numbers that are right there as well. Um, the durations, uh, EP El Nino um, is uh, not nearly as strong, uh, sorry, not nearly as numerous, but longer in duration with uh, 10.5 months. Um, CP La Nina is, uh, becoming more consistent as well. So uh, we are getting more um, CP La Ninas um, in that sense. Uh, when we're looking at the water vapor anomalies, we apply, um, uh, look at the anomalies over the same Nino 3.4 region. Um, we can see a lot of the same responses um, in the integrated water vapor when it comes to the strongest El Ninos and La Ninas as well. Um, the ranked uh, El Ninos and La Ninas are highlighted in blue. Uh, one thing to do, uh, also notice here is integrated water vapor can only get so dry. Uh, it's part of the reason why we don't see such a large anomaly when it comes to water vapor. Um, it's either zero or whatever higher availability. Um, yeah. um, the, the phase ranking does primarily follow this uh, sea surface temperature ranking as well. Um, and CPL Nino events actually can uh, produce some higher water, uh, integrated water vapor anomalies um, than most strong EPL Ninos as well. Um, response during La Nina events is marginal. Um, that's part of the reason why we're seeing such small anomalies in those. This is what uh, the visual representation of the integrated water vapor looks like as well. Uh, we do see a significant increase in integrated water vapor over the Central Pacific that we do not see over here in this, uh, uh, sorry, in the Central Pacific. I just got those backwards, sorry. For EP, EPL Ninos, <laughs> it, wow, okay, all right. Significant increase in, uh, in the Pacific for EPL Ninos. Um, not as much of a, an increase in precipitation, oh, sorry, integrated water vapor, but it is almost exactly centered over the dateline and the equator as well. Looking at the to uh, total precipitation anomalies, again, uh, strong, strong uh, El Ninos and La Ninas also do follow the same patterns as um, sea surface temperature as well. Again, the marginal, there's a marginal difference in your total precipitation um, for, El, uh, for La Ninas as well. You can only get so dry, and as it can, uh, the atmosphere just above the surface temperature continues to get colder, um, it only gets more dry. Um, the phase ranking, again, um, does somewhat follow, but is a little bit more variable. Uh, we see some differences in the uh, CPs for the, for the El Ninos um, with some strong uh, uh, similar issue, uh, observations where, where the strong LP, uh, CP El Nino events can produce higher uh, total precipitation. Um, and the, again, the response during La Nina events is marginal. Um, when we look at the visual representation of the total precipitation, um, we do see that, that large delta um, symbol that, or shape that is right here over the equator in the Central Pacific as well um, for CP El Ninos, but in e, uh, sorry, EP El Ninos, keep doing that, but in CP El Ninos, it's much more, uh, it's shifted towards the dateline and the delta is not nearly as large. Um, I had something else. Oh, um, and then the one thing to notice uh, for uh, CP El Nino is right here, you'd have a large increase in the um, total precipitation uh, between uh, Hawaii and Alaska as well. Alaska, uh, the Alaskan coast, as you guys know, uh, is a, actually technically a rainforest. Uh, in summary, uh, ENSO is a predominant form of seasonal variability with global impacts um, with signals uh, that are clear and recognizable. La Nina signals are marginal. Um, 
not much research has been done on uh, La Nina for that reason. Um, Eastern Pacific events do tend to be stronger than Central Pacific events. And integrated water vapor um, and total precipitation also do have similar responses as sea surface temperature. Uh, for future research, um, I would like to try to seek to create a CP versus EP atmospheric river climatology using these informa uh, this information. Um, also would like to investigate how well models can identify signals um, for other ENSO phases, um, just, to, just to see if we can actually see those in the models if the same signals are showing. Um, I also, also want to further understand the responses during different El Nino types uh, to improve predictability. And then I would like to look into see how other seasonal features like the Madden Julian oscillation impact the observed ENSO phase signals. Questions? Great job, Ryan. Got some questions for you? Some questions for Ryan today? Again, for those of you that are joining us online, you can use the Slido as well for questions for our presenters. That was a really interesting talk, thank you. Um, how much is the general warming of the oceans impacting these patterns that you're seeing? Um, in a, a broad sense, I don't feel like I could uh, give a definitive answer for that. Uh, but when I was looking at each individual season um, from 1979 to 2023, there was a very marked increase in the anomaly. Um, what would go from the, the, the negative value of blue, um, most of the Pacific Ocean started to become more and more red. Um, so I do feel that these patterns are actually um, resulting in a more predominant form of the Central Pacific um, rather than the uh, you know, canonical uh, Eastern Pacific that we're, we're all, we most of us know and talk about pretty much. So. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Got to Giancarlo. Wonderful talk. Um, so I have read in the past how uh, some volcanic eruptions have actually triggered similar like El Nino or La Nina-like effects. I was wondering if at any point in the research you kind of came across uh, where that might have influenced some of the data sets or any of the, I don't know, just uh, processes that you've been studying. So that's actually a great question. Um, I didn't actually specifically look into volcanic eruptions itself. Um, however, I did notice that there was a, a pretty significant difference um, when it come, came to the sea surface temperature changes um, shortly after the Tonga eruption. So um, I did notice that there was slight cooling um, of, of the sea surface temperature shortly after that, and it uh, presented uh, a lot, lot broader um, over the Pacific, um, but that would be a, a really nice way to take further, um, do further research is to, to see how that works because volcanic eruptions do impact the, uh, the modal transitions between ENSO phases. Mm -hmm. Great talk, Ryan. Um, I guess this one may be for future work, but I was just curious if you were going to look into if, like, let's say you have a transition from like a major El Nino to La Nina. Do you think that like a subset of like the La Niñas may transition into a specific subset of El Nino events? Would that be something that you would want to look into in the future? I would like to look further into that because that, that was one of the things that I did notice is typically when you have a really strong El Nino, it almost immediately transitions into the opposite of a strong La Nina. So if you have a strong um, Eastern Pacific, you end up getting a strong Central Pacific La Nina almost immediately after that. That is not always always the case, but it, that that is one of the things that it did happen. Uh, notice, tend to notice when I was uh, looking through most of my my data. So, thank you so much, Ryan. Thank you.